Welcome LA Progressive friends and family. Dick and I are just so honored to have Dr. Cornell West, who most of you know is running for president of the United States on the West Abdullah ticket uh, uh, with Melina, our dear friend Melina Abdullah running um, as his VP. Uh, it, this is just, it's, it's wonderful to see you um, and it's always um, enlightening and educational to speak, to speak to you. So Dick and I are looking forward to this conversation. So Dick, you're going to go ahead and introduce Dr. West. No, I'm going to introduce and then you're going to give your first question. I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, no, you relax. I'm, I'm the one blessed to be with you two magnificent ones, a dynamic duo. I can tell you that. Okay, so I'm just going straight from your website. We all know you as a public intellectual. We know you as an author. We know you as a professor. But on your website, you say that throughout hit your life, you have fearlessly questioned the status quo. And I can guarantee you that that is true. Challenging the prevailing narratives and championing the causes of justice and equality, your unwavering commitment to independent thought, and unapologetic pursuit of truth have made you a revered figure and for sure revered by me. Now, Dr. West, I'll, I'll tell you, I first heard about you way back when you wrote this book that I bought. Oh, <laughs> I don't know how long. I've had this in my library many years. <laughs> Lord, well, you must have been in junior high school when you read that now. <laughs> I wish that were true, but no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm going to say that when you really started to touch me was um, you and Tavis Smiley did a, a documentary. You were traveling across the country on a bus going to HBCUs. And Tavis brought that movie to a community in Los Angeles and he invited a few people and Dick and I were invited to sit and watch that. It was amazing with Dick Gregory and B.B. Winans and I just loved it. And I said, this man is brilliant. You, be, you were just brilliant just in your normal day-to-day -day life, sitting on the bus and funny as I don't know what. So, <laughs> so that, and then the book that you two wrote, um, The Rich and the Rest of Us, Dick and I, of course, we have the book. And then you and, and Tavis did a talk. You did several talks uh, in Southern California. We attended. And again, um, and, and we've been at several other events with you, but there's always a mob of people, and, including Occupy. So, so go ahead, Dick. Go ahead and ask Dr. West for your first question. I'm glad you mentioned Occupy. One of my favorite memories of you, sir, uh, was at the height of Occupy LA. You were giving a speech on the top of some steps, I think, at that city. Hall. Hall. And we we are 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 and Sam and I were in front of the building, pushing us up right again. We are the 99%. We are the 99%. We're doing everything we can to try to get this message out. I believe as a member of the media, as a member of the media on public television, especially on public television and public radio, it is my mission. It's my mandate, my calling, my vocation, my purpose. And to try to get Americans, if you have a legitimate grievance, this is where you need to be. This is where you need to be. I said the key said the key oh, Smiley, Tavis Smiley, Tavis Smiley, Tavis Smiley. Oh, yeah. What a beautiful, beautiful thing it is. And I'm telling you, there's such a sweet spirit here in Los Angeles because you have consecrated this space by bearing witness to them. That's what you thought. And over the years, you've been a powerful spoke. I mean, you're such a wonderful speaker. I mean, early on, you supported Obama and that changed and you were big in the Bernie Sanders campaign and have spoken on behalf of other people and other causes. So I wonder why this year did you choose to run yourself for office? 
Mm, no, again, appreciate that question, my dear brother. But I just want to sincerely say that uh, the impact and the work and witness of both of you, not just in L.A., but in the country, because I've been reading you. I remember it was Harold Meyerson way back when. I, I never miss L.A. Progressive. Oh. L.A. Progressive has been one of the great institutions, not just in L.A. and California, but in the country, that's been tied to the kind of truth-telling and justice-seeking that I've always wanted to be a part of. But as, as you can imagine, my brother, I've been running for justice for almost 55 years, and the context might change. It might be in the classroom. It might be in the cell. It might be in the street. It may give me a speech. I could be in a mosque. I could be in a synagogue. I could be in a church, uh, uh, trade unions. A hall, all of us just different contexts. Intellectual politics is just another context. Same issue, trying to tell the truth, condition of truth to allow suffering to speak, trying to pursue justice, which is keeping the love in it. Justice is what love looks like in public. Trying to be true to what has been poured into me by Irene West, Clifton West, Shallow Baptist Church, Black Panther Party, Dorothy Day, Rabbi Heschel. Edward Zaid, all of those who I've been blessed to be connected with and be a part of, and I'm just a small wave in that ocean. And so I, when I looked up, when I saw the various candidates, I said, no, my, my, my tradition is not being represented. It's not being heard. Too many poor people, too many working people, too many colonized people in the global south, too many women too many, uh, not being treated right, too many gay brothers and lesbian sisters and so forth. And so I uh, decided to make a run for it. And it's been a beautiful adventure, really. I've been at it 14 months now, so you can imagine. You know, I'm no spring chicken, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> 14 months every day going at it, meeting some of the most wonderful people you ever want to meet. I mean, I started in Mississippi for Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, great legacy there in Lexington with the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party when they endorsed me. And uh, uh, it's been really a beautiful thing ever since. But, you know, we've been targeted, as you can imagine. You know, it's hard to raise funds. We're being sued in the state of North Carolina now and Georgia. Looks like Pennsylvania. I mean, it, it, it gets very, very intense, as you can imagine, um, very much so. Yeah, so that's that's interesting that you should talk about, you know, being sued. And because really what you're up against, um, it's it's nothing short of a, a sort of a David and Goliath. I think you really do need your 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 faith in in this in this battle because um the deep pockets um they don't really care about the people that you speak about, you know, the LGBTQIA community, people of color. Um, their interests, the, the interests of the people who really run this machine, their interest is in their profits and their pockets. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, uh, and, and it's I mean, has contributed seriously to us not being able to have a serious progressive movement. That's true. You are so very, very right. I mean, we live in an empire that is in such spiritual decay and moral decadence. I mean, if you don't have the kind of civic virtue among your citizens, if everybody's for sale, if money is the idol, uh, if the golden calf is that which is to be worshiped, then you still have to bear witness, but you have to tell the truth about that. And that's why our crisis is not just economic. I call for the abolition of poverty. I always start with the least of these. I start with poor people, no matter what color, gender, sexual orientation, because it's a moral issue, spiritual issue. But uh, but it's not just a matter of material poverty. fact that uh, in a culture in which everyone is for sale, every everything and everybody's for sale, and people are able to come up with enough money and position and status and spectacle to dampen the fire of so many of those who would want to actually be more progressive, but feel as if the only real option is to be part and parcel of an unjust status quo that will give you a little bit, but it's just window dressing. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I, you know, I, I've had some efforts, even of the Democratic Party recently. You know, they want to, 
They want to meet and talk and talk about this money and what issues do you want in order to suspend your campaign or come and jump on their bandwagon and so forth. And I'm thinking like, good God almighty, I, I, uh, I would think it would be the suffering of the people and the social misery of poor citizens that they would be speaking to rather than just trying to buy off certain leaders or certain folk they think are influential that would add to their bandwagon. And I, I was telling them, I said, look, we, we got to fight fascism. There's no doubt about that. Trumpism is out of control. Trump's out of control. But they've got their lies and their crimes. But you don't fight fascism by just producing your own lies and your own crimes. And mass incarceration regimes a crime against humanity. Genocide in Gaza is a crime against humanity. Child poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world, what is it, 22% of all children, almost 38% of black and poor and red, that's a crime against humanity. There's nothing that's being, the, the, there's no major focus at all on trying to alleviate those catastrophes in either party. And to think that somehow you can just continually put it off so that each Democratic Party re, uh, administration becomes a kind of a postponing of fascism and every election becomes, well, we've got to come together because we got to fight. No, the fascism is at work in the hearts and minds and souls and material conditions of the people. If you don't speak to that, every four years you're going to get the same thing. We're not them, therefore we deserve your vote. We deserve your support. Well, societies don't function like that. You got to get to the core and the root of it, or sooner or later, it will triumph because you're going to reap what you sow sooner or later. There's no doubt about that. So uh, you talk about your campaign and you personally have been targeted lawsuits and w whatever people could do, the people with the money could do to silence you. Uh, but you're not alone. I mean, a, a whole slug of Black politicians have been forced out of office. Jamal Jamal oh. Bowman, Nina Turner, uh, Donna Edwards, and now Cory Bush is facing uh, an onslaught of of of, of money, pro-Israel money that drive her from office. Uh, what can we do about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, one of the things we could do is exactly what both of you are doing right now at LA Progressive. We just have to muster the courage to be consistent morally, politically, and spiritually in telling the truth about the power dynamics at work when it comes to pushing out the Nina Turners and the Bowmans and so forth. Corey Bush, I'm on my way, in fact, now to the 10th anniversary of the uh, of, of Brother Michael Brown in Ferguson, so I hope to get a chance yeah. to sit there and give her a hug, you know, because yeah. uh, uh, the election is tomorrow. And so we would already know by the time I get there on Friday. But we have to be in solidarity with each other. We've got to be supportive of each other. We have to be affirming of each other. It's critical, too, but affirming at that deeper level. Um, and we just have to uh, never be discouraged. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, ha we have to keep that. You know, Jamal Bowman, um, who was the he's, st he's still in office, I guess, until till January. Um, he was the representative for uh, the Bronx. And in fact, um, the projects where I was born and raised, Eden Wall projects in the, in the Bronx was his area. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I just, you know, I just thought, and I still know people who live in those projects. And I sent them messages, you know, hope you hope you're voting for Jamal Bowman. Uh, I didn't hear back from them. But, you know, so many people have lost hope and they are not civically engaged. And that is a major contributing factor as to why the progressive movement is so weak. I mean, I see it among my own family. So, you know, what's exciting to me, was exciting to me when I heard that you were running is that I thought that this would be an opportunity to um, engage a whole host of people who just have generally just given up. And ha how, how has that been? Has that been your experience? We've tried to make efforts so that you make a very powerful point. 80 million precious fellow citizens do not vote, do not participate in the political process at all. That's almost 38% of the 
of the population who could be uh, 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 who who could participate but don't, and is much higher among poor and working people, people, black folk and brown folk and others. Uh, they just look at politics and they see legalized bribery and and normalized corruption, and they're not completely wrong about that. But they conclude that they won't participate, and they are wrong about that. And one of the things we tried to do is to reach out to that 38%. But see, part of the problem, though, is, is that I've been very kind to have interviews like yourselves and others, and slices of corporate media will have me on CNN, and, and, uh, and, and News Nation will have me on every once in a while. But you just need money in order to get around to go where the people are. And, uh, and and we've had a challenge in terms of fundraising. It's just very, very difficult to, to convince people to, to provide some resources so you can get around and go where the people are. And that's been a challenge. South Carolina, well, I, we just go there on our own because they were, endo we were endorsed by the United Citizens Party, the Nellon Brothers, the very party that Clyburn founded in 1969 <laughs> when he was an insurgent candidate against Jim Crow Democratic Party in South Carolina. Uh, oh. now, now he's on the inside of the establishment and can't even fight for health care for all, receiving all that money from the pharmaceutical company. We were endorsed by the Green Mountain Party of Peace and Freedom. That's the party Bernie Sanders founded when he got to Vermont. And I'm telling you, this is a beautiful thing. We accept that endorsement. We're going to be on the ballot in those states. These are, these are particular state-centered uh, parties, you see. But in order to get out to Vermont, in order to get out to South Carolina, it takes money. And it's hard to get to fundraising in order to do that. So you end up going as many places as you can. And then, of course, I've done almost a thousand interviews in terms of... Uh, internet and, and so forth with young people and cultural artists and so forth and so on and religious folk as well as political pundits and things. But it's still hard to reach some of those precious folk in those projects uh, uh, where, where where you grew up, my dear sister. I lived in the Bronx for, for a while. Andrew Jack, where was it? Uh, South, South, Sound View. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know that area. Castle Hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In that area. Which, which part of the Bronx were you from, though? E Edenwall Projects, which is uh like 233rd Street, it's getting close up to Mount Vernon, North oh, Park Bronx. So you on the other side of the Bronx, then. Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah, the Boogie Down Bronx is a special place, very yeah. special. I took, place. I took, I took Dick there. Um, I was, I spent my childhood there. So even my teenage years, we moved to Queens. We lived in um, like St. Albans, Queens Village area. Yeah. But um, after Dick and I got married many, many years later, I took Dick to the projects and he was surprised to see that some of the people that lived there when I was growing up still live there. Those people in New yeah. York going to those apartments. Lord have mercy. <laughs> yeah, after after years and years and years, she knocked on the door and she, and she said, and somebody inside, is that Sharon? <laughs> And it's like he hadn't been there in 30 years. Yeah, and, they, and that little, family, little five little. generations, was still in the same apartment. Same apartment, yeah. Uh, and, it, and and sadly, I mean, they, they had wonderful, strong family connections, but a lack of civic engagement, a lack of hope, a lack of a sense of agency. And, mm -hmm. you know, so this is what you talk about. This is what you try to instill in, in people who generally are sort of neglected and and not really spoken to um, by by the, the the electeds by the political class the political class generally I mean until Occup um, the Occupy movement nobody was even really addressing issues of poverty and the main economic issues. Well, I mean, part of that, as you know, is the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer and others. The abolition of poverty set at the very center. Same is true with the abolition of homelessness or unhousedness. Same is true with the unbelievable grotesque wealth inequality. And same is true about stopping Cop City, let alone, you know, the genocide uh, in Gaza and so on, to just be consistent in terms of what's anti-militarism and anti-imperialism here. But see, part of it, though, is a matter of trying to connect with people's agency in whatever form it takes. Mm -hmm. Because you see, a lot of the folk in the project, if Luther Vandross came back from the dead and put on a concert, 
Huh. And the project going to show up looking so sharp with sophistication and a dignity. But see, that's not a civic agency, but that's a different kind of agency. That's you right. see what I mean? And the same is true about folk tied to the church. Some of those same folk will show up on Wednesday night, on Sunday morning, looking like Michael Jackson's mama with a level of sophistication and dignity. You say, oh, Miss Roosevelt, I didn't know that you, you're, yeah, I'm living in the projects there, and that's my pastor, Pastor Johnson. Yeah. But that's a certain kind of agency, that too. Is, that is. But it's not civic agency. Really, It's not political agency. It's just cultural or artistic so how do you well our challenge is how do we connect with that and then translate it into a political agency a civic involvement and that's where it's a difficult challenge it's, absolutely and i go you know, to a whole lot of those churches all around the country they say oh brother west we love what you said but we've given up all politics you know the politicians not worth a dime no big money is t dictating everything I said, well, you got a point, but you got the wrong conclusion. You know, Dr. West, in the <laughs> in the 60s, um, I was a child. I was alive. Uh, I, but I remember that Harry Belafonte and yes. uh, okay. Sidney Poitier oh, and, yeah. um, you know, the oh, Sammy Davis Jr. even, even though I know at one point he was a Republican, but they were part of a movement to change, to they attempted, they partnered with Dr. Martin Luther King and they attempted to radically change our society. And I remember when, um, before Harry Belafonte died, not too long before he died, he talked about where are the celebrities, the young black celebrities of today? You know, I, I, I don't know if, if any of them are, are tapping into your campaign. Um, I, I understand that Beyonce um, allowed um, Vice President Kamala Harris to use the Freedom Song. But where are they today? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. It's just hard to find them. It really is. It's, uh, again, you know, you, once you're in such a market-driven, money-centered activity like um, entertainment, and you remember what Michael, what, 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 what our dear brother, uh, the basketball player was talking about, he said, well, you know, uh, money is green. Michael Jordan say money's green and Republicans and Democrats use green. So I don't want to alienate any one of them so that my products won't be bought by them. Well, there was a certain honesty in what he was saying, yeah. but it reflected a conformity and a cowardliness in terms of the legacy of Tommy Smith, John Carlos, Kurt Flood, Althea Gibson, Muhammad Ali at the highest, those entertainers, celebrities, and even athletes who were willing to take a stand beyond their money-making activity. And that's what we don't see enough of. Now, we had the sister dancing the other day. What was her name? Uh, the Stallion. Oh, yeah. Um, Megan the Stallion. Megan, Megan, Megan out there working in Karen Allen, mm -hmm. or at least a little version of it. And that's fine, you know, because, I mean, you know, my view is that... Um, the anthem of black folk has always been lift every voice, right? It's not lift every echo. So we're not looking for a pie piper. So people are going to express themselves in a lot of different ways. Yes. They really are. Even the folk who support uh, uh, Sister Kamala now, I tell them, I said, just think for yourself, work it through, and then decide. You know, you don't have to follow me. We can still be in alliance and deep coalition on a number of issues of housing, children, a whole host of issues. But Please be true to yourself and don't just follow the echoes on the corporate media or just completely, you know, simply uh, re-echo what is said over and over again without thinking for yourself. But listen to what I have to say. Here's my vision. Here's my argument. Here's my witness. And this is why I'm thoroughly convinced the corporate duopoly is a matter of national security because it's not allowing enough voices to be heard that could help the American empire come to terms with its lies and its crimes so that we could, were able to empower poor and working people. But you can just listen to me. And if you say, oh, Brother West, you know, part of it sounds convincing, other part is plausible but not persuasive, that's fine. I understand that. But just be involved, be engaged, be willing to cut against the grain and think for yourself and have memories of the highest standards of the traditions that have produced you. 
if you're not using Martin Luther King Jr., let's say, as a standard, and if all you're talking about is just making a deal with the powers that be and then acting as if you're trying to be, to be a part of the legacy of Martin King, then you're lying to yourself. We have to be true to the best of the tradition, the highest standards that have been established by those who love us enough to live and die for us. And the us begins for me on the chocolate side of town, but it's really oppressed people around the world. But I begin with mama and daddy and grandmama and them, and then it spills over to. It could be the Irish against British imperialism. It could be the landless workers in Brazil. It could be peasants in Guatemala. It could be indigenous peoples on reservations. It could be Jews wrestling with vicious forms of anti-Jewish hatred, not just in Germany, but in France or in Pittsburgh in a synagogue. But it could be Palestinians dealing with vicious Israeli genocide and ethnic cleansing and apartheid and, and, and occupation. It morally consistent, politically consistent views of poor and working people who are not being treated the way in which they ought. That, to me, is what moral and spiritual greatness is. I know the gangster Trump, you know, he got his concept of the greatness. Oh, for him, Alexander the Great is the greatest. Well, for me, Dorothy Day. <laughs> yeah. It's a different conception of greatness. But I'm holding on to greatness. Oh, no doubt about that. So I so I mentioned about this her, her friend from Eden Moore Project. And really what we saw, uh, not to be too unkind, but it was kind of learned hopelessness or learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. they, they'd been there 50 years and not a lot had changed in their lives. Uh, and they didn't find the wherewithal to fight against it the way Sharon did. Um, and I relate that, that you know, when, when Barack Obama burst onto the scene, there was a great outpouring of hopefulness. And you were part of that early on. Now, as time went on and you saw what he actually did, you, you saw him more as a, a puppet of Wall Street. Well, here now in the in the last couple of weeks, we have the same burst of enthusiasm around an unusual uh, precedent breaking candidate. Um, do you see, do you worry that Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris will be co-opted in the way it appears that Barack Obama was? Yeah, I do. I do. In fact, I think in many ways she already is. But let me begin with this, that I have uh, serious prayers for my dear sister Harris uh, because she's on treacherous terrain. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about her safety, worried about her loved one. Uh, she she is part and parcel of uh, of the various traditions, the Howard University that produced the Tony Morrison's and the Felicia Rashad's and the Melina Abdullah's, my own run, running mate. And the same would be true with AKA. That's the that's my uh, sorority sister that I'd have deep love for. Uh, uh, and any time I see black folk with great smiles and joy in their heart. I'm uplifted. Mm -hmm. See, that could be at a concert of Aretha Franklin or that or Stevie Wonder, or that could be in church, or that could be in the barber shop, or that could be in the beauty. You could be in the projects, just hanging around in the corner when you see folk laughing and full of joy and all the mess we've been through, the blood, sweat, and tears we've had to come up with. When you see this joy, it's a beautiful thing. And so I do enjoy seeing that kind of joy, the 44,000 sisters that broke the internet and the 53,000 brothers and so on. But then, of course, the uh, the crucial question is, what is the moral content of that joy? What are the political consequences of that joy? Is it, dict is it guided by a vision that empowers the least of these? Or is it uncertain kind of illusion? Because, you know, Reverend Ike, could put joy in black people. I used to go to his services in New York. <laughs> and that Negro was about as right as two left shoes and about <laughs> as moral as a rock. You know? uh -huh. But he would pack the place, and he was he, he, he was in the, uh, the Washington Heights, but he would pack the place. So the joy was real. He had some of the greatest musicians in the city, so the music was rich. You know what I mean? Good God. But he he's he just a con man and a gangster as he can be. 
And that's true for so many of our preachers, unfortunately, because they transform these churches into businesses rather than really sites where love and truth can be dispensed and you get examples. So I do think that, uh, that, that she's already tied into Silicon Valley and you see the big money. You see, you don't raise $300 million in a matter of days and think that you're a free person. It, it, it just doesn't matter. Our political system is one in which you choose. You got the Republican Party, they plantation with the paid masters and the Lord, and the Democratic Party with their paid masters. We're going to see where she ends up on the genocide in Gaza, but already you don't see any serious talk about eliminating poverty. No, no. Not one. No. Just no. before just before we spoke to you, I interviewed um, a couple of young women who are working with ranked choice voting. Mm. And uh, one of them talked about, uh, well, you, you, she, she says, you know, we often talk about not um, not electing a, a bad apple um, because it's going to spoil the bunch. She said, the problem is not with the apples. The problem is with the barrel. <laughs> Ooh, and, that's a beautiful way of putting it. it. It's, I mean, when she said that, I said, oh, I'm stealing that metaphor because that's the problem <laughs> that we have. I don't care how wonderful these people are. I have met I've met um, Vice President Kamala Harris just briefly, and but you know from what I see, she's a lovely a lovely woman who has um, had some accomplishments in life, but she's also been a first black woman in a lot of areas where she's had to make some compromises that maybe I wouldn't have made, but you know I wasn't in those shoes. Um, but that barrel, she's been in that barrel. Absolutely. So that's what we need to change. That's exactly right. That 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 analogy is a very very powerful one, and it's uh, and it's something that you know people need to hear over and over again because they don't hear it on the corporate media. They don't hear it in the New York Times. They don't hear it in the Washington Post. That larger backdrop is eliminated, so that the things that she does, in fact, agree with, let's say, the Republican Party, absence of any talk about poverty not a serious commitment to empowerment of working people just symbolic gestures or going to maybe a, a picket line here or there or symbolically talking about the pro act yes we need pro act y'all should have passed that thing a long time ago should have passed it under obama he promised he was going to do it a long time ago it's, same is true in terms of even basic things like the, the george floyd bill and john lewis voting rights bill Democratic Party couldn't pass that in the last four years, and that was promised back then. And, you, and you're going to tell us you're really concerned about the Black community, and yet the Black women, especially the biggest voting bloc that you have? Please, no, your allegiance is somewhere else. Your That's allegiance is Wall Street. Your allegiance is the Pentagon and the war machine. Your allegiance is Silicon Valley. Your allegiance to your donors to your benefactors and to the big, big, big money folk. And that, and, and that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to see even my dear brother Bernie, I have a deep love for the brother and that's what I ever love. But to see him uh, uh, cave in so quickly and then to do it in such a way that you actually just lie about people like Biden Biden somehow is the most progressive president since FDR. <laughs> no union always had his harbor to working people. Quit lying, brother Bernie. You know that's not. Ask the credit card industry in Tel Delaware. Ask the Wall Street folk. Please ask the the, the 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 elites of the war machine. There's never a war that he didn't get excited about and support the invasion of Iraq and so forth and so on. You don't have to tell that lie. Is he better than Trump? Of course he's better than Trump. Tell the people the truth. Yeah. Respect them enough to tell them the truth, but don't lie. And why do they skip over LBJ and talk about FDR? Mm -hmm. FDR was a, you know, a towering figure, but Social Security did what? It supported workers other than agricultural laborers and domestic maids. Well, that was white supremacy operating given those Southern elites in the Democratic Party. So don't talk about legislation that just leaves out all the Jamals and Letitias and expect Black people to get excited about that. No, it was racist, but it was good for the working class on the vanilla side. We're in solidarity <laughs> with the vanilla brothers and sisters on the other side, but we over here too. LBJ made a difference. Anti-poverty, civil rights, voting rights, 
uh, housing and don't leapfrog over that Southern Texan. Was he a war criminal? Absolutely. Yes, he was a war. That's why Martin King broke with him in a fundamental way. That's why Martin King didn't support any of the parties as a party. Wow. Very so, so all through all through your life, as long as all the times I've seen you in person and on YouTube, and you seem like such a, a happy warrior. Uh even though you're pushing up against, as you say, the corporate duopoly that has all the cards. They're, they're going to win the hand. They're going to win the next hand. Uh, how do you sustain yourself emotionally and, and physically? Well, I love that phrase, happy warrior. I haven't been that, called a happy warrior by anybody in my life, my dear brother. <laughs> brother Dick, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> I really, really do. But of course, for me, I draw a radical distinction between happiness and joy. Yeah. Happiness, because I come out of the, uh, the the revolutionary black church tradition, and it's all fundamentally about a, a love that the world didn't give me, the world can't take away, and the fruit of that love is always a joy, and that joy is tied to a smile, is tied to a style, is tied to a sense of having an unstoppable fire in your bones and in your vein that can never be put out. Even bullets cannot put it out because others will be able to be tied themselves into that same fire and continue once your body is 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 uh, uh, once you no longer exist as a body, you might exist as something else, but we won't get into that right now. And so in that sense, you always begin with a note of gratitude and thankfulness. The fact that you are alive and was able to be so loved and to have the fruit of that love, a joy, as part and parcel of your growing up that you didn't deserve. We call it grace, you know, in the church. But it's a gift that you didn't deserve. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your, 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 your neighborhood. You didn't choose where you come from. And then was empowered enough to try to be an example for people, not just in word, but in deed, not just talking about it, but trying to continually do something that would inspire somebody else because you were so deeply inspired, you know? Mm -hmm. Love somebody else because you were so deeply loved. Spread a joy. So it's just part of this rich tradition of a Black folk who is deeply hated, produce love warriors, deeply terrorized, produce freedom fighters, deeply traumatized, produce wounded healers, deeply sorrowful, produce joy spreaders. That's the bounce back. And that's a beautiful bounce back. And so it, it's real compliment when you say happy warrior, because I'm certainly view myself as on the battlefield. I'll tell you that right now. I can't, <laughs> You've got I to be a warrior that. and a soldier and to have that <laughs> joyful thing. Well, speaking of being on the battlefield, is there anything about this campaign that shocks you about the operations of, because you know, you're not just campaigning, but you're also building a new party. Um, so you, you want to talk a little bit about the new party that you've created and and yes. how that is is proceeding? No, and the justice for all. And it's been really quite a uh, an amazing affair because you, you can imagine, you know, we started with zero states and and uh, and now I mean we're up to almost fifteen, and we, we're going to have about twenty five, thirty, thirty five by the end of the summer, and that's really quite amazing when you think of uh, I think of my beloved folk in the Green Party they've been around 30 some years they got 17 states mm. you know what I mean so that, that, that we've had a tremendous response and that is always inspiring that boys up your soul it really really does uh, uh, and of course as I mentioned before some of the smaller state centered uh, parties have already put us on the ballot so we didn't have to worry about having the justice for all party go through all of the process of signatures, petitions, and so forth, and monies too. And then we'll have some write-ins. You know, we'll have to do write-ins at the three biggest states because it's nearly impossible to get on the ballot in New York and, and Texas, 185,000 signatures in a certain amount of days in Texas. You, New York has, it gives you six weeks and you have to have 46,000, but at least one out of two are viewed as invalid when you hand them in. Yeah. And so you really have to get about 100,000 in order to satisfy that 46,000 
challenge that, uh, and that's what um, Brother R.F.K.J.R. with his reactionary views on the Palestinians and a whole host of very, very uh, uh, disappointing uh, pers uh, uh, policies that, that Brother Kennedy Jr. had. But we fought for him to, at least I supported him getting Secret, Secu Secret Service early on. Biden should have given him that Secret Service protection very, very early on. Finally, they did. Now, we sent letters to Biden for Secret Service protection, and they, they haven't responded at all. So we just out here on our own. Yeah. Definitely. So, so I in in getting ready for the talk, I, I I heard a speech where you said, rather than proposing a wealth tax as many uh, progressive people do, you would you would propose drastic cuts to the debt defense budget. Do you want to talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah, that I've I've discovered that all the talks about taxes too often is vacuous because the tremendous cleverness and smartness of the lawyers who the well-to-do hire come up with forms of tax evasion that no matter what is on the books they come up with ways of not having to pay those taxes and not just tax havens and cayman island but a whole host of various legal tricks that they use therefore for me i'm for a massive disinvestment in the military we don't need 800 military units around the world. We don't need 130 special operations in countries around the world. That's only if you want it to have an empire with total spectrum dominance, to use the language of the elites in Washington coming out of the State Department, Secretary of Defense, and Pentagon. That, that, that for me, the United States needs to be a nation among nations, a decent nation, a dignified nation among nations, so I am an anti-imperialist. I want to head the American empire in order to dismantle the empire. And so it, it means you're cutting radically against the grain, freeing up trillions and trillions of dollars that's now been invested in the military and reinvested in satisfying the basic social needs of everyday people, that we could wipe out poverty. I, here in L.A. with Skid Row, with brother, you all know, brother, uh, 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 our dear brother, Pastor, Q. Pastor Q. Yeah, we love that brother. Yeah, yeah. Church we, without we, walls and so forth. You see, they they can wipe that they, overnight mm -hmm. with serious resources and coming up with ways in which people would be able to support themselves and what have you. you see. But it's just a low priority. It's just a very very low priority, and the major priority is short term profit. I mean, that's part of the spiritual decadence of our society that. Fossil fuel companies will opt for short-term profit over the whole planet going under. That's, that's, that, that's a level of uh, gratuitous violence worthy of a Dostoevskyan novel. Mm -hmm. Back to the Grand Inquisitor and the Brothers Karamazov. What is this gratuitous violence human beings will opt for rather than doing something that's moral, full of compassion? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your platform. Yes, yes. So, so give us some of some of the highlights. Well, I mean, the highlights really would be trying to get some kind of civic oversight over corporations, so that the corporate domination of the economy is radically called into question. We actually talk about nationalization or democratization, but it goes hand in hand with decentralization. So it's not a matter of highly centralized forms, but but we're quite explicit about that when it comes to fossil fuel companies. We want to break up big tech uh, and decentralize big tech. We want to make sure that workers are on the various boards of these industries. So workers' voices are heard, the kind of thing that my dear brother Rich, Richard Wolf has been talking about now for decades. He and I go back almost 50 Years I supported him when he ran for mayor in 1985 in New Haven on the Green Party. The Green Party was the first candidate. But yeah, Rick Wolf and I said we were part of Social Text, which is a leading left wing journalist. Oh, yeah, journal. We Dick and I have gone to the Left Forum in New York. Um, yeah. yeah, so Rick Wolf is a dear friend of ours, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I've seen you speak there with uh, Chris Hayes and Rick Wolf and Cornell West on one single panel. Yeah, that's what we did. The three of us did. Chris Hedges and Brother Wolf. Yes, yeah. indeed. 
No, we, but Rick and Sister Harriet, though, see, we go back to not only social text, we go all the way back to monthly review with Brother Harry Magdoff and Paul Sweezy oh. and Petey. We used to meet every month and have dialogues together. He would come down from University of Massachusetts Amherst. So, and I'm saying all this to say that what he's been thinking about in terms of democratic control over the workplace and the voices of workers being heard is something that I take very seriously in terms of platform. And I just love the brother too. He's still at it. Oh, I know we love him. We, yeah. we, we've, we've interviewed him like in the past six months and you know, he just, it's interesting because he wrote an article that he contributed to the LA Progressive about the role that racism played in helping um, capitalism to structure capitalism and to grow capitalism. And I just, I love, you know, I love that that he could get on and speak so eloquently. And of course, he always injects all of his talks with some humor. So yeah, right. I mean, you just you, you sit transfixed, listen yeah, to him true. explain very complex economical um, concepts but in a way that a sixth grader can understand. That's exactly. Well, he's the only economist of any sophistication who has a rich sense of history in how it, most production are rooted in not just historical circumstances, but in uh, 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 cultural circumstances. He's got that sense of Joseph Schumpeter and Karl Polanyi and, 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 and Hell Broner. These are the economists and Marx who understood history too. 98% of economists these days are mathematicians, are quantitative economists, no sense of history whatsoever, just isolated individuals who are making choices based on the mechanisms that are, are ongoing vis-a-vis -vis production and consumption and so on. No, Rick Wolf comes out of that rich historical tradition. You know, he wrote a tradi his, his dissertation on Africa. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, he got an economist. Harvard trained, Stanford trained, who writes a dissertation on Kenya and, and the anti colonial struggle that was going on vis a vis the moment of the mode of production being reproduced in that colonial context. Mm -hmm. So he reads history. So he, he talks about the decline of the American empire. How many economists even talk about the decline of the American empire? Mm -hmm. They don't even see empires, they just see isolated individuals and production and consumption and so forth and see what statistics say. That's one of the reasons why you get these economists, nearly all of them will tell us the economy in America today is excellent. It's stronger than ever. <laughs> you say, have you been to Skid Row? 1% of the population own 90%, three individuals have wealth equivalent to 160 million. You're going to tell us the, the economy is excellent? What is your definition of excellent? Well, that's what the statistics say. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought so. That's how narrow and myopic and truncated your criteria is of things being excellent. 62% of the population living on paycheck to paycheck. And you're going to talk about how excellent the economy is? Please spare us. Rick, Rick, Rick Wolf, no, no. He got a sense of culture, history, and it, and it feeds how do you keep track of levels of social misery? How do you keep track of levels of exploitation? Are workers' voices being heard? Don't just look at the world through the lens of, Scott, of, of the stock market and the various statistics of inflation and low unemployment. Well, you got workers with two and three jobs still living in poverty, but you you you, you break dancing because the employment, the unemployment level so low. There's human beings beneath those statistics. That's where the history comes in. That's where culture comes in. That's where morality comes in. You see. Yeah. yeah, but if you, you know, if you live up on the upper upper east side of Manhattan or the upper west side, and all you associate with other people whose whose four hundred one ks are growing and growing and growing, the economy is awfully damn nice. And and you know, just if you're careful not to drive down by the Bowery or drive down by uh, LA's uh, Skid Row, then and, and and most people don't. I mean, most people just ignore that and 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 cast off. Uh, think it's a moral issue that people on Skid Row made those choices, and and if they've made other choices, they wouldn't be there. I don't know that that's a question, but but I but but I do know how that works. I mean, if you if you live in a bubble and you don't take the time to look outside of it, the world doesn't look like it really does. That is so very very true, and yet because 
our destiny, as you all know so well, is intertwined with the destiny of the precious brothers and sisters, Skid Row, South Central, East LA, and so forth. Right when the crisis hits, when the catastrophe finally makes its way, makes its way to all the various neighborhoods, mm -hmm. folk are flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> How could this be? I thought I know you've been in your bubble too long. Yeah. Need to break absolutely, but you're so right about people living in this narrow context in which they find it. But, but speaking of a bubble, um, you frequently let everyone know that you're a Christian, and I'm a Christian too. And I have to tell you, it really irks me when I hear about Christian nationalism. So I, I make it a point to always add white Christian nationalism because I don't know any black Christian nationalists. Can you talk to me about the role that your faith plays has played in keeping you doing what you're doing? And do you um, infuse any of that into your campaign or your connections? I'm gonna talk a little bit about your Christian faith. No, I mean, that was part of the struggle with the Green Party, God bless them, because they weren't used to having a Christian at all. So they raised questions about God and do you really believe in separation of church and state? We don't like this language. Same was true about the Black thing, too. I mean, they're not really fundamentally focused on the vicious legacy of white supremacy, though, though they've had a number of wonderful Black folk pass through, the Cynthia McKinney's and the Rosa Clemente's and the drama with Baracas and others. But you had to be true to yourself. And I want everybody to be true to themselves. You know what I mean? My precious, secular, atheistic, agnostic folk. Be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Speak from your heart. Speak from your soul. And I'm going to be true to myself in terms of my conception of Christianity. Now, as we know, Christianity got hijacked very, very early. I mean, Constantine made it a state religion, but it was a Roman Empire that put Jesus to death. It was the Palestinian Jew Jesus that was murdered by the Roman Empire. Yeah, so that same empire makes Christianity a state religion. So early on, they're in the lion's den. And then 100 years later, they're standing with the emperor. Well, somebody said, well, I think you got the message wrong. Yeah, <laughs> Constantinian Christianity, and that's the really source of Christian nationalism in, in the United States. It's just Constantinian Christianity. You see, it's, a, it's when the state or the empire picks up on the symbols and the stories of, of Christianity and adopt it to the empire and the nation. Now, I would say this, though, Sister Sharon, there are some Black Christian nationalists out there, but they're not as visible because they, are, they have a critique of white supremacy that the Christian white nationalists don't have. Mm -hmm. But you got a lot of Black Christians who put the flag over the cross. Oh. And that is a nationalist idolatry or an idolatry of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Every flag should be under the cross. Mm -hmm. And that cross signifies unarmed truth, unconditional love. That's what it is to be a Christian. Every human being you encounter is made in the image of a loving God who gives that person sanctity and dignity that no state, no society can take away. But nationalism is so powerful. And nationalism is very, very, very powerful among certain black folk. That was part of the impact of Obama. You see, once you got a black president and you saw black folk waving flags that had been waving before because they identified with the nation state mm -hmm. and the head of that nation state. And so when we were critical of Obama dropping those drones in Somalia and Pakistan and so forth, because we're saying a baby in Pakistan has the same value as a baby in America. And they say, well, I understand that, you know, in the Christian context, but everybody knows that American life is more precious than other lives. Oh See, that that's Christian nationalism. Mm. Any Christian to believe that a life in Los Angeles has more value than a life in Ethiopia or Ireland, you letting the cross go. You waving the flag. And we're seeing this more and more among so many of the uh, the black politicians and so forth. You see, it's, it's really about American lives. It's just about American babies. That's what we're concerned about. When American lives are lost, that's when we really mourn and cry. Wait a minute, you got 15,000 Palestinian babies who've been killed. You can't say a mumbling word. 
please. The same is true with the universities. You know, I, I traveled to all these universities, 19 universities abolished. Have you heard one word of a university president say a word about university? You got the black journalist just the other day, 165 Palestinian journalists killed, murdered. Did we hear one word from those black journalists? No. You see what I mean? Where's the Christian witness here? Get that flag out of the way and be concerned about that cross that opens you to the humanity of everybody. That's right. You see what I mean? And there's ways in which you can be patriotic, of course, that the, the people you grew up with and you share certain things with, you have intimacy. But when it comes to your moral witness, you don't act as if their lives are better than other people's lives you never met. That's what the Christian gospel tried to tell you, that tell tell all of us, right? That that brother and sister all the way down in, in Guinea and in Guam has the same value as Letitia and Jamal, who you play basketball with and slow dance with under the purple light in the garage to the Mighty <laughs> Dells and the Delphonics. <laughs> My light was red. Oh, yours are red. Oh, Lord. See, the Bronx, the Bronx are always on the cutting edge. I, I, I. <laughs> but you, you all see the point I'm making, though, you see. There's always been that, been that challenge. But you are absolutely right in terms of uh, not having a major black uh, Christian nationalist movement because it's just so deeply white supremacist. But I'll tell you this, when I was in Charlottesville, I saw two black folk marching with the neo-Nazis and the Klan. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, said, he just, just confused. And I ran into David Duke when I was down there. The Klan was founded against Jews, Catholics, and Black folk. David Duke is a Catholic, and he's headed one of the Klans. I said, that's upward mobility American style. <laughs> <laughs> just, now you got the Klan. Next thing you know, you're going to have Blacks and Jewish folk there because uh, human beings make choices. Yeah, I wouldn't they hold can, my breath on that. I tell you, people choose gangster and thuggish things in a lot of different ways, and it comes no matter what community you you you, you find yourself in. No, it's true. So we're we're coming up on the the end of this interview. And before we close, you were you have said, and I hope this is becomes reality that this is more than a campaign, that it's a movement. Yes. Yes. So I, you know, I want to hear your thoughts on this being a movement. Yeah, one is that it's both the institutional capacity of it, both the justice for all, as well as the kind of united front that Brother Daruba and Brother Kalandri have called for. We we need a united front. We can learn uh -huh. from France. United front does not have to, to take the form of one party dropping out for an election, but it has to take the form of parties and pre-party formations coming together against the escalating fascism. Mm -hmm. What whatever happens November the fifth, fascism still around and escalating. That's right. And my hunch is, though I could be wrong, my hunch is that uh, if if Trump wins, they'll feel victorious. If he doesn't win, they're gonna say it was rigged, and therefore they're still gonna have a certain kind of organizing and mobilizing and galvanizing uh, effort to take place. Mm -hmm. So that possibility of a civil war in one form or another is always there. And then that's coinciding with, you know, the escalating World War III that we're seeing in, in the Middle East, with China and Asia, with Russia, on the edges of, of Europe. I mean, this is a hell of a time to be alive. It is. And that's one reason why we need each other. The love between us, the magnificent love I see between you all. You see, that gives me joy. That brings me great joy. It really, the smiles in your faces, the joy that overflows in your soul. Those are the things that are moments of the interruption of so much of the worst of history, the organized greed and the weaponized hatred and the routinized indifference to the vulnerable. How do we create some interruption? Well, it's individual interpersonal, organizational, truth, justice, love. Well, that's the perfect closing. Dr. West, it's been such a pleasure spending this hour with you. Well, you all bless me, but stay strong. Keep taking such magnificent care and loving, loving care of each other. And just know that 
All of us are going to go down swinging like Ella Fitzgerald and Muhammad Ali and Hank Aaron swinging that bat and hitting those home runs for the people. That's right. Thank you so much. Yeah, so what, long. what an honor. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.